You're listening to The Artist Athlete, show number one, baby. Yeah. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I am the host of The Artist Athlete podcast. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It is a resource for those working in the industry to share our stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into our world. My first guest is acrobatic and aerial rigger Brett Copes. Brett's company, Fight or Flight Entertainment, has rigged for stunts, circus productions, individual performers, and troops of all sizes in the U.S. and internationally. He was the head rigger of seven circus festivals, rigged for Cirque du Soleil, Marvel Universe Live, Cavalia, and has recently worked as the acrobatic rigging project manager for the Helen Fisher Tour with 45 Degrees. He is the new owner of The Space, a stunt and aerial arts studio in Atlanta, Georgia, where he spends his free time being one of my favorite drinking buddies. Brett, welcome to the show. I can see you trying not to look at the laptop. Yeah, I'm not looking at you. Don't look at the don't look at the question. We've only got one microphone, so we're, our heads are huddled close together. Yes, very romantic. All right, go on. So, give me. Uh, I'm ready. All give, right. Give me what you got. So, are you aware that there's a group on Facebook? It's called the um, <clears throat> the Safety and Aerial Arts Group. Yeah. Have you heard of it? Yes. I've Maybe heard you're of that. vaguely aware that it exists. There's mm. about fifteen thousand people who are subscribed to it. Sure. When I decided that you were allowed on my show, uh, I posted some questions on there to ask what people would want to know from a professional rigger such as yourself. And the number one question everyone wanted to know, and this was the first question I was going to ask you anyway, is what is the most unsafe thing you have ever seen in your entire life? Oh, geez. Um, That's a... Yeah, I'd have to think. Um, Well, I would hate to make you do something like that. uh, The most most unsafe. Uh, That's a real... I You know, I... Um, I don't. I don't tend to think about things as being uh, safe or unsafe because um, it's not. That's not something that exists in reality. That's just a human emotion. So, but what I will do is, or uh, is kind of take a look at what risks, what risks are available and what risks aren't uh, as available, and try to work it out. I. I think uh, I did this job. I mean, I've been to Ecuador and I've been to South America, and there's always some really weird stuff. But we had this rigger in Ecuador who was just an old school circus rigger and was uh, terrible, terrible. And uh, I mean, I I have an entire album of stuff in Ecuador that this guy did. But then I walk. (laughs) Like a photo album? You just got it? Yeah, a photo album of of ridiculous choices. Like we would have to go up to a piece of truss and we're going to tie five five ropes onto the piece of truss. And he would make up knots that no one had ever seen before. And it's not like he would do that for each, uh, the same knot that he just made up for all of them. He'd make up a brand new knot each time. He was tying knots in cable, which you're not supposed to do, can't do. Um, I just, and he would wear a, he wore a shirt that said, um, rigor because badass isn't a job title. And so it was that kind of guy. And the first time I walked in the studio, um, I'm watch, uh, an entire net of 10 performers fall to the ground that he rigged, um, because he was tying knots and stuff. You're not supposed to tie knots in and it broke with that many people on it. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what I was saying. I, you know, you the, the, the answer—the answer to the question is when it I'll, honestly, literally, when it comes to the most unsafe thing I've ever seen, it it always boils down to some person doing something. I want to hear you talk a bit more about this idea that safety is a feeling or an emotion, right? Yeah. <clears throat> that there are things that are quantifiable, but safety is not one of them. No, safety is a complete is is. Safety is, is a perception. You, f- you feel safe or you feel unsafe, but it doesn't really have any, it's just based on what you're able to perceive. It doesn't have anything to do with how, when it comes to circus, it doesn't have anything to do with how strong something is or how strong it's not, or that if we move it in this direction, um, it's more dangerous than if we move it in that direction. Now, risk, on the other hand, there are risks that are perceived and you either sure. accept those risks or you find a way to mitigate those risks as well as judge whether they're possible from happen. But but safe, safe is just a feeling. Um, uh, I, I think, I think the number one thing I hate, I, I, 
I hate hearing is when uh, uh, somebody says like, I'm not worried about it. I feel completely safe with so-and-so doing my rigging for me. That, that's not a quantifiable thing. I can't figure out, I can't figure out whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, just because you don't know something's dangerous doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Or just because you don't know that something's not strong enough doesn't mean it's an inch or a pound away from breaking. So your feeling safe or not feeling safe really isn't of value to me. And uh, that's and that's the and that's and the hard yeah, part. It's hard to talk sure. about because that's the term that's used. That's the term I get asked. Can we make this safe or what is safe? And it's it's a uh, it's not a, it's really not a good term to use. And in other industries, they don't use it. What do they use? Um, we no longer use like safety factor was something that was used for a long time, and mm -hmm. now they're taking. Can you explain what safety? Uh, factor sorry, safety is? factor is how much stronger is something than what you're expected to put a load on it. So something's you're going to put 100 pounds on something and it holds 200 pounds it's a safety factor um but they're even they're taking that vernacular out so now it's going to be called a design factor um and just in in the sciences that safe safe or unsafe is being taken out and it's things aren't spoken about in that way do they say to a risk factor or what is the... Yeah, you know, the, one of the things that's different about the United States um, than everywhere else is that unless you work for a really high level company, like if we go to Europe or we go to England, I'm sorry, England's in Europe. If we go to Europe, uh, we, go to, right. we'll edit that we, go to, we go to Australia, we go to Ireland, which may or may not, Scotland's not in Europe anymore. <laughs> um, but they all do risk assessments for all of their acrobatic rigging. It's, a, it's just a common thing that has to be done. And um, it's not done here. In fact, if, if we were to grab 10 professional riggers that are giving advice on safety and aerial arts and ask them to do a risk assessment, they've never done one before or have never seen one before. Um, but it's a formal thing that does exist. And other, other industries do it, where you list the risks that are perceivable. You kind of rank them as to which ones you think could actually possibly have. What is the likelihood of them happening? And then you start to make a list of like, well, what can we do to reduce these risks? And sometimes it's sometimes it's just simple things, like um, having lights turned on is one that could hmm, re reduces a sure. lot of risk. Or you know, and <clears throat> it's odd. I think it's odd in showbiz in the United States because they do it for pyrotechnics. Hmm. Yeah. And the the lighting company will do it for the rigging of the lights. And you know, these other parts of the industry that have progressed a little bit further than the human hanging side. Like they're doing this work, they're doing this kind of risk assessment. But I mean, outside of the Montreal, the big Montreal companies, I've never seen a United States company that flies people do a risk assessment. Now, it doesn't mean they're not doing it, but I haven't seen it, it hasn't been presented to me. Um, and anytime I will, anytime we bring it up on my side, it seems to be something that's no one's really prepared to participate in. Do you think that's something that studio owners or performing aerialists who are independently contracted should make as part of their practices to do a risk assessment themselves or bring in well, a rigger you, to you, do you so? Kind, you kind of, you, we're already doing kind of like an informal risk assessment where it looks like if that's not strong enough, I could fall and get hurt, right? That's a risk assessment. If it's not strong enough, I could Doesn't fall. Doesn't sound like a very scientific risk right, assessment. Right, but that's exactly what it is. You observe. Sure. You observe. You document. And then you assess. That's, that's all it is. You make a list of everything you think can go wrong. You figure out which ones are more likely than others. And then you uh, what are some ways that you can make them better? Because, you know, the <laughs> if your goal is to not have anyone fall, the best way to do that is to never leave the ground. Once you leave the ground, your ability to not have anyone fall it goes almost evaporates. So now it's just a matter of... If you want to use safety, it's a it's a degree of safety. It's a degree of risk reduction, right? You can't eliminate all the risks. The risk is gravity will interact on the object and it could fall. Um, so it's just a matter of risk reduction, and some of it's more helpful than others. The uh, would not reducing the risk at all isn't helpful. Some of sometimes the risk reduction can be very simple. Can we make it better? Um, and then you know how much better can you make it? is really the kind of the goal when it comes to that risk assessment. So do studio owners need to do it? And do performers need to do it? I think I think the people who are rigging for them don't understand understand it most of the time. 
And um, I think it's it would be it would it would only so if we if the risk is nobody knows what's going on, right? Then if we if people find out more about what's going on, we reduce the risk. Sure. So we just did the risk assessment on people doing risk assessments. <laughs> so now I guess the question is, how do we find people, or how do we start to know what's going on? Do we go well, to I mean, certification programs yeah, if, for this? If, if you we... go to any other industry and you create a certificate or you create a set of rules, I mean, that's great. And you've got a framework, right? And you know, you kind of have the perception that if we move outside of the rules, it's probably not great or it's probably more risky. That would be the goal. Um, just there's something weird about the United States because each state has different rules and the United States is so vast and... Um, Everyone's very entitled and empowered here, so everyone's an expert. <laughs> um, that everyone can't, I get that in other countries yeah. too. There are a lot of experts out there. That every, the everyone can't Dunning get Dunning Kruger effect as yeah. well. Everyone can't get together and, and decide what the what the good helpful rules would be. And it's um Does this not exist in circus at all? Like I'm I'm shocked to hear that maybe in Montreal or some kind they don't have as part of the Ecole or some school like this a rigging program where you could get a college degree in circus rigging, just as you could in circus dramaturgy or um, acrobatics. Yeah, I th maybe it's because this like the things that you're doing are too are too different. The sample source is too wide. Um, you know, even working for even working for the big Montreal company, the company is so big. Not every show does things the same way, and then there are some things that throughout the company are done the same way. Um, and and that, so what are the things that are done differently or an example of something that's done differently? Well, I mean, it, it depends on what the, it, it really depends on what the purpose is. Like if we're, we're doing an act that no one's done before. So uh, we realize that so we're going to have to use these pieces of equipment that may not be as strong, but we're going to create a, a protocol to make sure that we reduce the risk in another way. Um, and I think the, the great thing about the big Montreal company is that uh, I, I think we're allowed to say Cirque du Soleil. I just don't, you I don't, just don't, I don't like that. I don't okay. want to say that. Okay. The big um, Montreal company. The big Montreal. Is that... That, does, that I, isn't really... You know what? Really it with that company, I would say this. It, it feels like having worked for them, it feels like somewhere along the line long ago, the rigging department got... is the most powerful department. And if the... You know, when we were, when we were building shows or creating shows, the rigging department has a ton of power. And they get to say what we're, what what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. While every other department's trying to figure out how to put the sequence on the feathers to make the frog with feathers today, you know. But the rigging department gets to say we're going to do this and we're not going to do this, and that's just the way it is. And it seems to stick. So somewhere along the line, the company gave a lot of power to the rigging departments, um, and and because they do all kind of come out of the same central hub. You know, there are some things that are done the exact same way across the board. What's an example of something that's done the same way across the board? Well, I, they claim, well, you know, that we Or we could say it's industry standard, maybe? Nah, Can but they are, that's, no. they're not the entire industry. In fact, right. as a matter of fact, they're more of a microcosm because if you try to do stuff outside of that company without all of that company's support, it doesn't work. If you tried to do... But thereby, wouldn't you say that... They well, are making the standard then if you're trying to go against them and that doesn't I, work. I would say that they have a they have a, a huge interest in their rigging and they have a very high standard that other companies aren't able to achieve. And um because of funding? I think it's just I honestly it's I don't think it's a money thing. It's just a philosophy thing. Interesting. So you're saying companies aren't able to achieve the they're same not, they're, quality. They're not rigging. able to put a show to, you know, it's because it, they don't prioritize it? Maybe they don't prioritize it. The focus goes elsewhere. Money could be a concern. Time is usually the deal that they don't spend. They don't spend the amount of time on things that that company would. They, mm. don't, they don't create inspections. They don't staff. If we needed, you know, every show is trying to do the show with the least amount of people backstage. And, but I've never worked on a production with that company where we didn't have enough people. Interesting. If anything, we had extra people and figured out what it took and then reduced them. So, but at the same time, the, the, that company's, you know, going through some changes as well. They're making things smaller, but I, it's just a philosophy. I, I honestly think it's a, it's just a philosophy change in that they, somewhere along the line, put a great deal of energy and effort into this is really important. 
uh, we're really going to work hard on making this. Um, we're going to give it the amount of time and support and funding that it needs to make sure that it's an important part of every production. They don't do it with pyro or they don't do it with, you know, they'll spend a lot of money on artistic scenic elements, but the rigging department on those shows has a lot of power. And if you work, but if you work for another production company who may have five or 10 shows on the road or who are, who are running circuses for 60 years, yeah. uh, there is no rigging. Yeah. Department. I've experienced this. Yeah, so there is no, sure. that department doesn't exist. Right. So it's just a different, it's not to say that they're not able to handle the work, uh, in, in a way to reduce the risk, but it's just a different philosophy. So if you don't work for the big Montreal company yeah. and you assess the risk and decide you still want to hang in the air, who do you go to or how do you find someone? Because you're just, you're here and <clears throat> we have you in Atlanta, but where are the other Brett Copeses in the world? Where are the other riggers who have the kind of experience and how do people <laughs> find them? Well, they're not on the internet. That's for sure. Okay. Um, there's uh... That sucks because you can't Google a rigger? There, you know, honestly, the, the the riggers that I go to for advice and look up look up to and have worked with, uh, and or have worked for me, and that I would think are the the most elite team of smartest hang people in the air riggers, uh, never post on the internet. That's not um, that's not something they're doing. They're too busy doing the work. Right, they're working. Yeah. There's, uh, there's no, there's, I think there's, it's almost more damaging a lot of the stuff that gets posted on the internet. I don't think it's helpful. Um, but uh, where would you find them? Well, this podcast, you know, is going to be on the internet and I'm mm -hmm. hoping it's helpful to somebody. Yeah, so maybe we can change the trend a little bit or something. I don't something. know where you'd find them. I think it's really kind of word of mouth and it's, yeah. it's also because like, well, what are sure. you, what, what are you looking for? That's, that's the, I mean, I know what I'm looking for when I hire other riggers and I know what I think sets me apart from other riggers. So when I'm advertising myself to something, I know what to accentuate, but at the same time, that title rigger is just a title that 40 guys could have on a, and maybe a, one girl on a load in and one girl could have on a load in <laughs> and, and we're all looked at the same. Um, so it's really, it's hard to differentiate. Wow, you make it sound so simple. I know. It's Everyone could be a rigger. But look, that's an important, that's just a piece of information. If we're going to go, if we're at a shipyard and we're going to pick up a, a canister full of trucks and we know that it's a 10 ton canister, well, we know exactly how much it weighs. We know that when we pick it up and move it, it's going to be 50% heavier because it's moving. And we know how much the crane that's lifting it holds. So you, you can be a dummy and do that job. Now all the shipyard guys are going to come beat me up. Yeah, they're going to call them all dummies. Yeah, for but sure. they can't find me because they yeah. don't know numbers. You're on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the good but, riggers aren't, but, but you it's are. Not, yeah. Um, the challenge with people is that are they an object that moves? Are they an object that not moves? Um, things like that. And and for, I don't know why those numbers were a mystery or hidden or nobody measured them or or what. But I think they're fairly easy to find. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, well, why, in my experience, people just don't account for it. People sure. say, okay, well, this thing can hold this much weight and you weigh this much. So therefore it can hold you. They don't, they neglect to think about how much force a human being can generate yeah. when falling through the air. Well, look, uh, you're never going to find a rigger that says, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. I that's, need I need to find <laughs> more information. True. Yeah. And if there's one thing that's going to get all of your friends dropped on their heads is because there's a bunch of people walking around saying, I know what I'm doing. Don't worry. You're safe. And you accept that. So you as a professional rigger, uh, your risk assessment of professional riggers is that they are the riskiest part of this whole lot. Yeah, you know, if they're not asking you, if they're not asking you questions and listening to what you have to say, I think that you're in trouble. Hmm. If there's one thing, uh, that's my, my biggest crusade in the last handful of years is that I believe aerialists, circus performers have been going out and trying to find the answers and the information that they need to, to help themselves um, kind of figure out how to be less risky when they rig. But the riggers that they have to interact with won't listen to them, don't care, don't answer to their questions. Um, and that information is lost. And that's how we get people dropped on their heads. 
right. from a rigger who said, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. That attitude, right? If your doctor came in to do surgery and said, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I, and uh, sorry, if you went in for heart surgery. Well, sur I would actually on. be very com comforted if, by that. If you, if you went in for heart surgery. <laughs> if my doctor started asking me questions about how to do the heart yeah, surgery. Let, let me make it better. If, you're, if you went in for heart surgery and your plastic surgeon came in and said, I'm going to do this. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I don't have any plastic surgery. <laughs> I mean, but Yet. that's that, that's the thing. This false sense of security, hmm. false sense of security, and the people who aren't uh, being a student of it, who aren't need, who don't realize that they don't know what they don't know, are putting people in danger. Yeah, it's funny. It's um, like in the in the situation you pose, which I think is accurate. Um, it almost sounds like the aerialists in these situations have more information about what they're doing than the riggers do. Yeah, and and they don't get listened to. Mm. They don't. I mean, we can. So why do you think aerialists um, don't just? <laughs> why do you think they seek riggers then? If they have more information. Well, uh, so you don't have to deal with it. We got other stuff to do. Oh, because we're lazy. No, it's really it's really <laughs> yeah, we're lazy because the, they're because they're so tired from doing push-ups that. <laughs> Um, Gotta get the trap I, I don't know. I don't know. I know as a performer, your focus is on the performing. Right. Right. And, you know, clipping in your apparatus to something is probably, you know, it kind of ends up lower down the end of the list of your focus. I get, the question is, do I, are you asking me, do I think that every aerialist needs to know more about rigging? They wouldn't. What? They wouldn't if the riggers knew more to help them. And don't, don't forget, just remember this. The conversation we were having didn't exist 20 years ago. Because, right, because there were no podcasts. Oh, that's true. That's exactly why. <laughs> um, no, because there were no riggers. And actually... Interesting. Uh, there were no riggers 20 years ago. No, I mean, well, there were no circus, there were no circus riggers. Performers would rig their own equipment. If you go to the circus now, there's no riggers. Actually, outside of the big Montreal companies... I challenge you to, oh, I, yeah. to find a touring show that has flying performers that even has a rigging department. So it's not common, it's not normal to have these individuals outside of outside of maybe the Peter Pan flying companies with CFX and Vertigo and Flying by Foy. And those are flying directors. They don't call themselves riggers. Um, that, that these jobs are handled by a crew member or by the performer themselves. Any traditional circus performer is going to say, I don't need a rigger, we rig for ourselves. But they've also more than likely learned it through trial and error and it was passed down. Do they really know, do they really know the risk versus reducing the risk? It seems to be working, so we'll just keep doing it. Sure. Um, so it's a, it's a conundrum. As Ariel has been blowing up for the last 10 years, People have been standing up, holding up their hands and saying, I'm a rigger and I'm here to help you. And as a social dynamic, it's an... <laughs> Bruce, you're next. Wait your turn. As a social dynamic, it's an, it's an interesting... That was Brett's dog, Bruce. He's very eager to be interviewed. He's so. protecting us from the neighborhood. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, yeah, there were no riggers 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and, and there's barely any now, honestly. It's not, and that's not a criticism on it. It's just the way it kind of is. Yeah, I don't, I don't. So how did you become a rigger? Well, I was, a. Uh, I mean, just to make a longer story short, I was, a. Uh, I worked in the Boy Scouts. That's how everyone becomes a rigger. <laughs> I did learn to tie a bull in when I went to Girl yeah, Scout yeah. camp. That was like. I was in the Boy Scouts and we did ropes courses in the Boy Scouts. Yeah. That was a very brand new thing at the time. And um, then I was, years later, I was a stuntman, and we would rig for ourselves as stuntmen. And so here's harnesses and ropes again. And uh, I did some rock climbing wall stuff. And then um, I was a, perf I was a, a performer for um, almost 20 years, 15 years. And then when I decided to, to shift away from performing and try to find a, a and what am I going to do now, um, I gra started to gravitate toward rigging. I didn't get there right away, but... I started working at different scene shops and on different productions and through about about ten, up 10 year progression. Um, I learned quite a bit more. I ended up being uh, the head rigger on the last show I performed in as a circus performer. And then, <clears throat> uh, and then I got a job with Cirque du Soleil. And since I got that job, um, 
with Cirque du Soleil, I, I haven't done anything else other than just rigging for people. But I'm also a student of it. I think I feel like I came to it late. I could have just uh, been a rigger for Cirque forever on a show. Sure. Um, but I was really interested in, in learning more about it and doing more and uh, participating in more shows and individual performers and um, kind of got really, really deep into it. And I still do. I'm, I still go to other, I still go to trainings and I still go to workshops and I will take everybody else's workshops. I'm going to a, a pretty significant training two weeks from now to learn more. Um, so I kind of became a student of it. Uh, almost none of which is required for the job of being an acrobatic rigger. Right, because there's no like continuing rigging education. I, well, I, yeah, like I, I don't. I don't need to like know. That. Yeah, I don't need to know all of these things no to, have, test to have a you job. Or yeah. Keep those hours. Um, what if someone wanted to go to maybe not get a certification, but just go to a rigging workshop? Can you recommend any, or what? Is, what do you consider like <laughs> the best of the best? I'm sure they'll send you some money if you plug them. So. No, um, I think there's a real. I don't, if somebody wants to be like a circus rigger, acrobatic rigger, mm -hmm. I don't, none of them are really like, take that workshop and you'll understand. Sure. But what do you think a good introductory workshop would be or something? That's a real hard one. I think. I, I mean, you were making some selection or choice or you decided to go to this one. Oh yeah, but I'm not, good, go I'm so going like... to, I'm going to a gigantic rigging summer. It has nothing to do with acrobatics. So, um, I think there's a, there's a couple of, there's a couple of good, there's, there's a couple of good stunt rigging seminars. Um, I think I would go to all of them, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible, but I would go to all of them because... Okay, well, maybe I'll ask Brett later when he's a little drunker and I'll put it in the show notes for you guys. A couple of good rigging workshops. And well, the, well first, of all, first of all, there aren't any. Who's teaching them? Because there, there's maybe three guys that are teaching and, and maybe two of them shouldn't, right? So go to all of them and you're going to have to put put into practice what seems useful to you. And if you want to get further training beyond that, even when I worked for Cirque du Soleil, we would, we had a training budget on the show. We would get trained in things, but they wouldn't be specific to our job. We would get, we would get rope access trained and we do use some of the rope access training for rescues. And it does have, there are parts of it that are helpful for acrobatic rigging, but being a rope access technician and getting that training doesn't directly. Can make... you talk about what a rope access Sorry. technician is real quick? Rope no, access sorry. rope access is an industrial uh, working. So you're you're on a rope on the side of a building being supported by a rope and with a backup is another rope. So your window washers are rope access technicians, oil cool. oil refineries, people who paint things, and people who rescue uh, injured people out of canyons in the mountains are rope access technicians. They're doing things with rope and lifting people. Um, so, but, but that training, you have to pick, you have to take the parts of it that are now applicable to you as a acrobatic rigger. Sure. Um, same thing. We'll do industrial, uh, um, industrial fall protection training, stopping people from falling off of I beams on a workplace. Um, and we have to know that stuff to do some of the work that we do, but some of it also does apply or it's similar. You're stopping a human being from falling, um, but you have to, you kind of have to go through it and pick, well, what parts of this are applicable to what it is I'm doing? Um, so that's the, yeah, I'm, I wish, I wish I could give you a simple answer of take this workshop, take that workshop, take that training. Um, and I can, uh, Vertigo Flying Effects does something called Top Flight Academy. Um, they used to be Hall and Associates flying effects, and then they were just flying effects for a while. And that happens once a year. They get, whether they know it or not, they get a lot of people to come to their workshop because I send them, I think it's one of, Bruce and I think it's one of the best, <laughs> one of the best sit down book learning stuff, but it does mostly Peter Pan flying. Um, but some of it's very similar, but uh, I really like Top Flight Academy. Um, I trained with Kier Beck, who's a, a stunt rigger out of Australia. Uh, I think he's a smart guy. He's on the right track, approaches the material in a good way. Um, and then honestly, just, just take everyone's, if there's somebody offering a rigging workshop, take it, mm. um, I think. And then you'll have to figure out what parts of it apply to you and, and what don't. Sure. Okay. Last question. Also from the safety and aerial arts forum. Oh, geez. So they wanted to know what 
The question was, what is the sturdiest shopping cart to use as an apparatus? Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, it was a good question, I thought. Um, I want more questions like that. Yeah, it was a good one. So I wanted, so obviously you can't hang from a shopping cart in the air. That's not true. You can hang from anything you want to hang from. <laughs> right, as long as, provided you do a risk assessment ahead of time and well, look, determine if, if, you if you're it's worried it's going to be safe or not. If you hang from it and it doesn't fall, it must be fine. <laughs> if your goal is to just be held up in the air. Sure. Uh, yeah, I like this. I like the shopping cart thing. I would say, I mean, I'm partial to uh, the Ralphs on Van Nuys Boulevard. Uh, in Burbank, California, I okay. think they have the best and sturdiest shopping carts. Okay, great. Um, so anyone who's going to do an aerial shopping cart act, the Ralphs on Burbank. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, uh, an interesting thing about the question is, um, yeah, I, my response to that would be, well, let's get five, let's just get the shopping cart and break it and find out how strong it is, because that's the real answer. If yeah. We, if we put that, if we put that question up on a forum on the internet, you would have a thousand responses to it. None of which would be helpful, and he's you would have. He's talking very close to the mic, so you know he's. And, and you have no information afterwards. So let's let's put it through a real like just break it, and then you, then there's no question about it. You know it breaks at this or it doesn't break at that, and and everybody, you know the internet experts can't really argue with it because you did it in reality. You get that in in circuit. People talk about how to do moves or what shows should be like and how much people should charge for things and stuff like that. It's, it can, you can, it can end up being something that people talk about a lot, sure. but, but yeah. the people who are doing it don't have to ask that question. You learn it by doing it. It happens in reality. You're not wondering whether it's safe or not. You now know it's this strong or not. Yes. But in order for them to do it, they had to first think of it and ask some question about it. Yeah. It's just how they found the answer, I guess. Yeah. Let's break some shopping carts. Let's do it. Cool. Well, that's it. That's, that's a my... good way to end it. So Brett and I are going to go have this beer and then break some shopping carts. And um, thanks for coming on the show, Brett. Sure. It was very chatty. I feel very chatty. Yeah, you chatted a lot. That's good, though. That was, that was the point. I didn't get to tell any jokes. Do you want to tell a joke? No, I don't. You don't You can ask, tell a joke. You don't ask to tell Brett, a joke. tell a joke. Jokes organically happen. <laughs> Look, this is what you circus performers don't know. When you're a speaking performer, jokes happen, you know guys in your lats. Hey guys, it's Shannon here. So that was um, my interview with professional rigger Brett Copes. And um, <laughs> whoa, what an interview it was. I'm sure that it was not the interview. You, maybe it wasn't the interview you were expecting. I don't know. If you know Brett, you probably weren't surprised at all. Um, but hopefully, whatever you were expecting, what you heard got you thinking or um, will start a conversation. And I would be remiss if I didn't add in my two cents, since this is my podcast, um, about some impressions or some thoughts that I had that I wanted to share with you guys. The first thing that struck me was Brett making the distinction between safety and risk. In his approach, safety is a feeling, whereas risks are quantifiable dangers. Brett believes the best practice is to do a risk assessment of any situation you might be involved in to help you determine how safe you can feel. For example, if I wanted to ring by aerial silk to a magnolia tree, dun dun dun, in my front yard, uh, the popular opinion is that I just should not. It's very dangerous to hang from trees. I should forget it. I should pack it in, ship it out. See you later, Jose. It's just not going to happen. Stop dreaming about it. Um, but following Brett's model, I would sit down and make a list of all the factors that might put me in danger. Is there a branch that's accessible? How well do I know the health of the tree? Does the time of day affect my visibility? What is the weather like? What tricks or skills am I going to execute? Is there a hornet's nest next to the branch I want to hang on? I sit down and I look at all these factors, plus many, many more, and off of those factors, I make my decision based on if or how I can reduce them. And is that reduction enough to make me feel safe about rigging from a tree. To some of you, that still may seem crazy, but we have to remember 
this is circus. And I think of someone like Nick Walinda, who was the first person to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Now, if you were to ask someone on an internet forum if it was a good idea to rig a tightrope across a 167-foot waterfall, normal people would say absolutely not. It can't and shouldn't be done. But Nick Walinda who has an immense amount of experience and knowledge, sat down, did a risk assessment, and went about mitigating as much of that risk as possible to feel safe enough to do it. As a result, he pulled off a feat of skill and beauty and got the attention of the entire world. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we we all assume risk, and it's okay to um, put yourself at risk because... You must acknowledge by being in the air, you are at risk of gravity and falling. But we have to take steps in avoiding the accidents. And the first step is, according to Brett, recognizing and determining if you have the skill set to mitigate them. Brett also brought up the red flag of riggers who do not listen to aerialists. This is something that I've experienced personally. Mostly it happens at corporate gigs or one-off events where... For some reason, I can't or I'm not available to do my own rigging. Usually I do rig my own equipment, um, but sometimes I'm not available or because there's a union or some uh, in-house troop or in-house team that does the rigging, I can't do it myself. And that's fine, but I still go in and before I get in the air, I ask a load of questions. Um, And I want to use this moment to empower all of you to do the same, to do your own risk assessments and ask your riggers questions. And don't stop asking questions until you get a satisfying answer. Don't worry about seeming whiny or needy or difficult to work with. Anyone who hires you will understand. And if they don't, then don't work for them. As we established earlier, you're already putting yourself at risk just by doing your job. And it's up to you and no one else to mitigate as many of those risks as you can. And that includes the human risk factor of your rigor. I can't speak for all aerialists, but when I'm working, clipping in my apparatus is central and paramount to my focus. It's the most important part of my performance. And if I'm not satisfied with what I'm clipping into, then I don't perform. Finally, I loved when Brett said he's not only a rigger, he's a student of rigging. Learn everything you can and keep learning at all times. And this really applies, I guess, to anything that you want to excel at in life. Um, Keep being a student. Since there's no certification for rigging, go to any workshop or seminar or person who's offering an educational opportunity and find the information that's relevant to the situations you're in as an aerial acrobat or acrobatic rigger. I've got some, uh, I've got a list in the show notes for you. I snuck into Brett's room and stole it in the middle of the night because he wouldn't give me the answer during the podcast. And um, that's about it for me. Thank you guys so much for listening to my very first episode. You can support the show by subscribing, rating and reviewing it on iTunes. And if you have questions or comments or concerns, um, you can find me at www.theartistathlete.com. And uh, I'm still going through the process of learning how to podcast. So heads up, the next few shows have some great guests, but they may be a little rough. Stick with me. It's going to be a great show, guys. question is from the same Wait, day. What, what is the name of the podcast? No, uh, I'm going to do all that what? before. <laughs> I'm going to fix that in post, dude. Don't tell me how to run a podcast. Are you asking me questions? Are you going to give me Yeah, an I was. Are you going to tell me how to run my podcast? I'm just curious about what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> this is going to be terrible. <laughs> You're it's just not so be fired. Thing. This is awful.